I don't think, now nah, there it is. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Sounds a little hot, doesn't it? Is it? A little loud? Is it okay? Fine? Hi, Trey. Hi, Emmy. Y'all hear me okay? Don't worry, I'm not going to come by and touch y'all's mother. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, <laughs> you really did. Okay. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, tonight. And uh, those who are viewing online, welcome to you as well. Glad you're tuned in. Uh, the only announcement that I have, other than uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up, school is about to come to an end, all those things, changes in some uh, worship times and that sort of thing, look on the front page of your newsletter. Uh, I, Danielle, it's on the front page again this week, isn't it? All right. On the front page of your newsletter, the schedule change is there. Um, so be aware of that. But tomorrow at noon uh, is the uh, Legacy Builder Luncheon. And so you are, if you're a Legacy Builder, you are invited and encouraged to come. We've got 90 pieces of chicken to come. So somebody better come help me eat some, some gospel bird tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, all righty, let's take a look at the prayer sheet and see what's happening here. Uh, a couple of things to highlight for you uh, on our list. Uh, Yvonne Davis is in Fairview Park Hospital with pneumonia. Talked with her today, or Jan did, <coughs> well we did. Uh, that's a good a speakerphone, you can do that. And uh, she said she was better today than she was yesterday, uh, but still, you know, having some issues with that pneumonia. So pray for her. And then you see under tests and procedures, Frank Connors having a heart cath tomorrow. Uh, be in prayer for him. And then you see the others with the list. Uh, little Bo Floyd, that's Andrea's grandson, is having surgery uh, tomorrow as well. So... Uh, Pray for them as, uh, as they prepare for that. Uh, well, they're preparing. I guess they're up there now because they were going to leave this afternoon. And uh, just pray for the little fellow that's having this surgery. And then, of course, also remember um, the family of Hazel Bennett, uh, Danny's mother. And then you see the other names listed throughout our prayer list there of the various ones. Uh, Ms. Martha Stroop uh, had a an MRI got some, had she gotten the results or getting it? She's, she's going to get it. So she, t tomorrow she's getting, that's right. Cause she said she wouldn't be able to come to the luncheon cause she goes tomorrow to get results from her, her MRI. So pray that she gets some good news there. And I think that's the only update I have on any of those. Um, Do you have any updates on any of these, our church family? Miss Hazel Mullis, her sister is in swing bed, and I'd call her by name if I could remember it. That's it. Y'all did good. I thought I'd test y'all and see how y'all were doing, and you did well. Uh, but she's in swing bed, so... Uh, Pray for her, because I think, I, think, uh, I think Hazel's trying to take care. You know more about this than I do. No? <laughs> well, we saw Hazel this morning. She had a bandage on this side. I don't know if she'd been in a fight or something, but <laughs> she had. <laughs> I hate to see the other person. Uh, no, pray for Hazel. She's kind of being a caregiver, I think, these days. Uh, so pray for them. Uh, pray for who? <laughs> yeah. I heard a little of that in conversation with those two this morning. <laughs> it was kind of interesting, to say the least. Okay, any updates that you have? All right, we'll move down to our extended 
uh, family, and you see the names there. A couple of things I'd highlight for you there. Uh, in addition to our prayer list this week, uh, in the center column, about midway down, you'll see the names of James and Jerry Holland. Many of you remember those folks. Uh, they at one time were members here at First Baptist, and then they went out to Empire, and Empire, as you know, uh, has disbanded, and so that leaves uh, James and Jerry without a, a church, and so uh, they're homebound, and if you have opportunity and uh, want to run out and see them, I'm sure they'd appreciate you coming. Uh, Miss Jerry deals with uh, some dementia, uh, but I believe, and I don't remember this exactly, but I believe James's next birthday, he's going to be 90, and uh, Miss Jerry, well, she's not quite that old yet. Was that diplomatic or what? <laughs> okay. And then over on the far side, about two-thirds of the way, or a third of the way down, you'll see the name of Wendy Smith. That's Ronnie Smith's wife. Uh, not the Ronnie that plays in the band. Uh, but Frank Connor's daughter. And she's having gallbladder surgery tomorrow, so pray for her. As well as, and I think I've overlooked him when I went past it, uh, up at the top of the middle column, Troy Dykes, and that's Wendy's uh, brother-in-law and Frank's son-in-law. And, uh, you know, Frank mentioned that, I think, yesterday, or it was in Sunday School Sunday, that uh, Troy's been having some problems with some cancer on his ear and... Uh, they're still working on that, so pray for him. <coughs> also, Cookie Porter called this afternoon and asked that we add the name of her sister and brother-in-law, Joe and Gwen Cox. And y'all know Gwen and Joe, probably. If you went to the gym, uh, oh, I don't know, in several years back when Joe was in charge of the early morning crowd, uh, and uh, he has an aneurysm, and so uh, would like for them to be added. Any updates that you have on any of these? Okie dokie. Let's go to the back side. And, of course, we have the names of our folks uh, at home, senior living. I went by and saw Bob Sawyer yesterday afternoon. Uh, Bob took a fall Friday evening and as you can imagine falls are not our friends and uh, he's just suffering from some of the after effects of that along with other things that's going on if you want a full report on him you won't get it because of HIPAA but talk to Joyce <laughs> any other updates on any of our folks that are in our various facilities. All right, special prayer needs, there's sheet there. I uh, understand Limestone's going to be voting uh, on a candidate tonight. I believe it was, so uh, pray for them. They're on our list down there. They're searched for a youth pastor, so pray for them tonight. And also then our missionaries, you'll find them on the far side over there. Anything or anybody we need to be praying for? Danielle, we got them covered this week. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, spend a few minutes in prayer. And uh, speaking of prayer, let me just encourage you with this. Uh, our adults are meeting on Sunday evening in the sanctuary. Uh, and, and what we're doing is praying. And it's not really a directed prayer time, but it's a time where we just gather uh, as, as a group. Uh, and, and it reminds me of uh, when I was a, a younger pastor and even a, a boy growing up in my church on Wednesday night when we had prayer meeting and it came time for prayer, the pastor might would start the prayer or he'd call on someone and then a, a, a good number of our men and sometimes women would pray all across the room there. Uh, and that's kind of what we're seeing on Sunday night, but it's a good time uh, to come together and pray. Uh, 
It's just a good, a good thing. So I would encourage you to join us and be a part of that. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pause in the middle of a busy, busy week just to say we love you and thank you for loving us. And you loved us so much that you were willing to send your son to die for our sins. And we could never say thank you enough for that. We, we are thankful for all of the blessings you give to us. Some are material things we can see, experience with our five senses, but others are spiritual blessings that cannot be seen but can be experienced. And we thank you for those. We thank you that you hear our prayers, that you answer our prayers. And Lord, in those times when you answer them differently, differently from what we would desire, give us understanding, give us patience, and help us to understand that you know what's best in every situation. Thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, your grace. I pray your blessings on those who are here tonight and as PK comes to share with us uh, from your word. Uh, I pray for those, Father, who are watching online. I pray you'll bless them. And for all of those that are on our prayer sheet, the needs, whatever they may be, would you meet them according to your perfect and precious will? All of this we ask in the sweet and strong name of Jesus. Amen. I have a Bible. I'm going to get it out. And um, <clears throat> starting at Exodus 33. And we're going to end at Exodus 34. Maybe. Going to do our best. For those of you, two things. I missed the first couple of minutes where Clyde was leading us. Uh, I had gotten a text right, I mean, right as I was walking out getting ready to walk out to come over here. There was a student at the middle school today. Was that mentioned? There's a student at our middle school that um, attempted suicide and was not, accept, uh, was, was not successful but is in the uh, uh, intensive care unit right now. Um, still kind of dicey. And the person who shared that said, I can't give any details, obviously, or name. Just wanted you to know. So they're on your prayer list. If you use that in your closet or wherever for your prayer time, um, <clears throat> just put middle school student <clears throat> uh, dealing with the after effects of an attempted suicide and be in prayer uh, for that family. <clears throat> On a totally different note that absolutely has no eternal value whatsoever, um, our high school baseball team won their first game 6-3. to three. And So they are just now starting game 2 for what that's worth. Exodus chapter 33 verse 1. Remember now, as we as we pick it up here, we've had the um, we, we've had the big confrontation, Moses coming down, Aaron, his complicity and all that stuff, the golden calf, and uh, so now we're kind of moving in the days after that. Verse uh, verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, uh, "Leave this place, <clears throat> you and the people you brought up out of Egypt." And uh, go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Now, I want you to think about what God's saying right there. That's, that's really kind of a scary thought. He says, okay, I, I promise it. Go ahead. I'll clear the way. Go ahead, but I'm not going to go with you. You know, his presence in the cloud, in the fire, um, <clears throat> on the top of the mountain, in the tent of meeting, which had been in the middle of the camp, it had been so clearly evident through this whole deal. And, and here he says, I, I can't, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to be there. And I'm like, wow. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, is it possible sometimes that we can, to some degree, experience blessings 
but not be close in our fellowship with God. I think a church can do that. I, th I think very easily a church can experience some good things and some things that have eternal value, but yet be lacking in that close fellowship with God. For instance, in, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 7, verse 6, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. It's just one verse. I'll read it to you. But Jesus was being questioned by the Sadducees and Pharisees, and he quotes Isaiah. And the verse reads like this. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about, prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. And then he quotes, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart <clears throat> is far from me. And I think that is a reality we always have to be careful about, is not going through the motions of being the body of Christ, meaning on the street corner, going, you know, with our lips, with our outer behavior, you know, proclaiming Christ, so to speak, but on the inside, just having really no depth or intimacy or fellowship with him. And he says, I, I'm, I'm not going to go. I, I, I might would destroy you on the way. And... Um, <clears throat> I want you to look at the reaction of the people in verse 4. They heard this. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. And what was the, after, after they began to mourn, this, this idea of crying out, groaning, what was the first thing that they did or didn't do? Yeah, uh-huh. They had been putting on all that finery that, that, that God had provided them through the people of Egypt in their exodus. And they had used a good portion of it to magically produce a golden calf. And so they look, they, they, they're now very sensitive to the fact that, oh, okay, that, that stuff got us in some serious trouble. And I don't want to mess with that anymore. And so that, they didn't even put it on. The Lord said to Moses, or he had, had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So they were responding to what God had said to Moses, and he had related. They recognized that this, all, all this gold and these earrings and these uh, rings and all this, the stuff that they had been adorning themselves with had drawn them away from God, had... had um, had, had, had been a stumbling block to them. So verse 6, they stripped off their ornaments uh, there at the mountain. Now I want to stop. I, the, whole, the whole way through this study, I've been trying to, when, we, when it was pretty clear, connect Old Testament to New Testament back and forth, you know, to, to see ourselves, to see the good news of Jesus Christ in this, to, to see mercy and to see grace and, and all these kind of things. And I see this right here where we see the people... Um, who, who have been, I mean, they, they have suffered. Their sin cost them. A lot of people are dead that weren't dead just a couple of days ago before all Moses coming down and God and people being um, slain by the plague and by the sword. I mean, it, it, it was, the fallout of sin is always bad, okay? It, it's, it's, it's always hurtful. Sin, sin upsets the fellowship. Now, the great thing about our relationship with God Okay, our relationship with God is not based on our performance. It's based on God's grace, right? We stand in grace. Okay, so our relationship with God is never in jeopardy. And God's Holy Spirit lives in us. He does not pull his Holy Spirit out, put his Holy Spirit back in. He's not pulling out. But what happens is when we sin, we constrict the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Not because the Holy Spirit isn't greater than our sin, absolutely, but because we have chosen sin and there must come a point where we confess that sin, seek forgiveness, seek cleansing, so that we experience the restoration and the freedom of the fellowship that we have with God through Jesus Christ and with this Holy Spirit that lives in us. So for us, it's not about the relationship being at risk, but it definitely is about how sin upsets the fellowship between us and God, the intimacy of the, the walk that God has called us to. And so there, there, is, there is always, almost always after sin, after willingly entering into sin, following sin, walking away from the innocence of God, there's always a time of healing and restoration that, that's necessary. Uh, it really is. Not that God has to learn to trust us. That's not it. 
is that we've got to, we almost have to relearn to trust God's love for us because of the shame that we bring, because of how hard it is for us to forgive ourselves. One of the hardest things for me in my personal walk with Jesus is accepting that once I've asked forgiveness, I receive that forgiveness and my sin is removed. How far? And remembered how often? No more. Yeah, that's hard. Especially when you're coming out of a season of sin, a, a moment of sin, whatever it might be, and you're coming back into the incredible grace and mercy and love of God and being washed and being cleansed and you're experiencing that. Man, that, that's, that's, sometimes that's so hard to look into the face of that kind of love and, 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 and to really truly trust that he's not looking at you thinking about that sin. He's looking at you with the joy of a father whose child has come home. All you got to do is go to the story of the prodigal son. When he came back, what, what was the father's response? I mean, did he berate him? He did. He ran to meet him, put a robe on him, signified right away, you're my son. You remember that speech that the prodigal son had prepared? What was he going to say? Hey, Pops, I, I know I messed up, okay? So you got to demote me. I know I can't go back to where I was. And, and so just I, I'm, I'm good to be a servant. Just put me in the servant's quarters. I'll get three squares a day. I have a place to sleep. That's, that's better than where I was. And the father says, no, no, you're my son. You're my son. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. And oftentimes, after receiving Christ as our Savior, okay, and we come to him seeking forgiveness, seeking healing, seeking restoration, you know, that whole process. Oftentimes, we come with the same attitude as the prodigal son, where we just kind of want to come to God with a, you know, with, with a bargain. You know, God, I'm coming, I'm confessing sin, and listen, I know, I know I've messed up, and I, I know that, that you're going to demote me, and I deserve that. I, I deserve to be demoted. And, and so just, you know, if you'll just put me somewhere, and, and you don't have to bless me a lot, and, but just, just put me somewhere, and, and God's like, no, you're, you're my daughter, you're, you're my son. This is joy to me that you came from that. You recognize the wrongness of that sin. You've come back. And he wraps that robe of righteousness even tighter around us. And, and heaven celebrates with every believer who comes back after a season or a time of sin, comes back for that cleansing. Um, so the people were mourning. They were, they were taking off their jewelry. They were responding they were like, okay, we don't want this stuff that has gotten us in trouble before to get us in trouble again. And God had said, don't put that, don't, don't, don't flash that stuff around. That's not who you are as my people. That's not where your joy is. And, um, and you know that they, you know, you know, that they were a little bit, a little bit on edge because anything having to do with that ornament stuff was a reminder of the golden calf debacle that was crushed up, remember, made into dust, and they had to do what with that golden calf? They had to drink it because it, it spread in the stream, and then they had to drink it. It was a sign of remorse. Over in Matthew 5, okay, Jesus is teaching us about the importance of walking away from those things that would get in the way of our spiritual walk with him. There's a story also in the New Testament, um, which is a good example. We call him the rich young ruler. We don't know his name, right? We just know he came. He, asked, he was asking about eternal life. God, God, Jesus, he responded. He named some of the well-known commandments. And this young man said, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Check, 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 check. But God looked in his heart, and he knew there was one thing there that was actually keeping him from experiencing the fullness of a relationship with God. And so he says, I need you to go and sell everything you've got, give it away to the poor, and come follow me. And what does the Bible tell us about that young, rich ruler's response? He did what? He wouldn't do it. Why? Because he was, because it was a, sac it was, it was a sacrifice. You know, he, he couldn't let go of that which was separating him from that in incredible intimacy of fellowship with God. And I have to ask you, this is a great question for you to ask of God in your quiet time. What is it you're holding on to in your life that is separating you actually from a deeper experience of the intimacy of God? In Matthew 
uh, 5, when Jesus is kind of speaking about this kind of stuff, and it's right after the Beatitudes and all those great verses, he says, look, if your right eye causes you to sin, do what with it? Okay, now, Jesus isn't talking about self-mutilation here. That's not his point. His point is that which is leading you into the bad place, whatever the bad place is, you need to cut that out of your life. Cut it out. He talked about the eye. It'd be better to tear it out and throw it away. Better you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. It goes on in verse 30. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body going to hell. Great day. I, this is one of those where if, 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 um, if we applied this in a, in a uh, heretical way and said this is to be taken literally, okay, great, our churches would be full of what kind of people? Blind, one or, I'm, I'm thinking blind, no armed, no legged. We would be torsos coming in here. Why? Because great day. The point he's making here is you got to decide what is it in your life? Is there something in your life that you think is more valuable to you than an intimate, deep, abiding, powerful fellowship and relationship with God? If there is something standing in that way, if there is something that keeps pulling you away, tugging you away from all that God would have for you, you need to let go of it. You need to get rid of it. It's, it's just not worth it. The Israelites displayed that. They, God said, don't put that stuff on. They didn't put that stuff on. They were repentant. They, they, they put it away. They, they said, okay, no, no, no more. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what is, what is it in my life? I mean, it could be something that in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it's become a bad thing in your life. Somebody, real quick, let me see if you're getting this. What's something that a person could have in their life that in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it has become a bad thing for an individual because it actually is now pulling them away from their relationship with God? Somebody give me an example. Children. Yes. Okay, let's start. Let's, let's spend a little time on children. Um. When I hear a parent say, and I understand, look, I understand exactly the sentiment, okay? Um, but, but I'm also, a lot of times I'll say, wait, 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 stop. I think about that for a minute. But when I hear a parent say, my children are the most important thing in this world to me. I'm like, that's going to be a problem. That, that Jesus wants to be the most important thing, period, in your life. As a matter of fact, you cannot be the kind of parent God wants you to be until Christ is the most important thing in your life. That's a good one. Children. Somebody else said one. What? Said money. M uh, money. Yeah. I don't know what that would be like, but I'm, there are those people that, uh, yeah, money is the thing that, that they, they desire that they hold on to, that they grasp, that they continue to pursue. The rich young ruler, we just talked about him, and that story's been being played out uh, during all the centuries of mankind. Money in and of itself is amoral. It's neither good nor bad. And actually, it's not that we are, are supposed to, to be careful about um, money itself, but we're really supposed to run from what? The, the love of money, that love of money that separates us from an even greater rich Thing, and that is intimacy with God. One more. What's one more? Just think about it. I want to see if anybody's brave enough to bring this one up. Okay, social media. Yeah. Or maybe even we can narrow that down more to the smartphone, to the thing that keeps us company. And if things don't change related to our cell phones, our, 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 uh, our smartphones, you know what, what it's going to look like in about 20 years? Everybody's going to walk around like this. And when you speak to them, they're going to say, hey, hey, what's up? What's on your neck? I don't know. It grew this way while I was looking at my phone. I can't even pick my head up anymore. My, my wife was having some problems with <laughs> soreness in the muscle back there. And we almost, well, we did have a fight, kind of. And um, she said, I don't, I don't know what's wrong. I said, it might be all that time you spend on your phone. <laughs> Bless her. Okay, so, so you're kind of getting this. You're kind of getting it. 
we, we, need, we, we need to maybe learn from the Israelites right here. Yeah, they messed up, but they were quick to say, okay, we're not, uh, we won't put it on. I don't want anything to do with those ornaments. They're still in the tent. I'm going to wait till the offering is taken up, and then they're going straight to God. Verse 7, it was Moses' practice, okay, so we get a little bit of an insight into daily life. It was Moses' practice uh, to take the tent of meeting, and that, that tent, that, this was the tent that was used before the actual tabernacle was constructed. So <clears throat> he set it up some distance from the camp, and everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. Make a quick application right here. Up until this time, during this journey, this tent of meeting has been in the middle of the camp. Right in the middle of all the hustle and bustle. Now, after what happened at the foot of the mountain, the golden calf, all that stuff, you know, God and, and how that fellowship with God now has been strained. And so now the tent of meeting is set up outside the camp. Okay, I want you to think about that for a minute. It is now that we see, this is one of the first times we see this, in, in, in terms of the relationship between God and his people, okay? Now, now those who wanted to make a request of the Lord, those who wanted to be in the presence of the Lord, now for the first time, you know what they're having to do? They're having to leave home and go somewhere that is a special place of gathering before the Lord. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like what we do almost every Sunday and Wednesday, isn't it? I mean, you're kind of seeing the genesis of this, not... Not that this is the only place that God dwells because we live in the New Testament. We know the Holy Spirit of God is with us everywhere, but we see this, this thing right here. But the beauty of this, if we, if we think about it, it's a reminder, uh, a couple of things. God makes his presence available to anyone who, who seeks him, who, who seeks him. He's, he's easily found. Everybody knew where the tent of meeting now was outside the camp, but it required the effort to come to be with him. You know, we talk about how important a quiet time is in our life, a time when we step out of our whatever our routine is and we go to wherever that closet is that you go to to spend time with God, and he meets us there, but we, we go. Rarely does God come to where we are, and then tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, let's have quiet time together. We seek him. We come to him, and he's, he's always found. But we have to be willing to break away from the noise of the crowd, from the, from the busyness of our schedules, from all the stuff going on, to be with God, to come to him and be in his presence and, and experience the fullness of what he's got going on. It's just an interesting picture there that now the tent of meeting is out here and, and the people who, who would, would ask something of him or speak with him must head out there uh, to that special place of meeting. Verse 8, whenever Moses went out to this tent of meeting, all the people would get up, stand in the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. And, and, and as he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. So when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, that let them know that God was with them, albeit outside the camp now. They understood what was going on outside the camp, but he was there. His presence was visibly seen. They, they recognized it, and it did something to them. They would stand, verse 10, the second part, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. And I, I don't, there's no way to demonstrate this, but if you could just in your imagination, if you, you know, how, I don't know how good your imagination is, but just imagine this beautiful picture because you got to remember there were hundreds of thousands of Israelites on this whole Exodus journey. So there were tents everywhere, everywhere. And, 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 and when Moses would begin to make his way out there to the tent of meeting, which could be seen, it just wasn't in the middle of everything. It was out here, just outside the camp. They would all come to the door of their tent, and they would watch. They would watch him go, and they would watch him go in. And then when they saw the, the cloud come and settle there at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and they, they knew that the presence of God was right there in their midst, what was their reaction? Was to do what? You, you, you can look in your Bible. You can use cheat notes. They, they worshiped. 
and, and one of the physical expressions of their worship was what? Bowing down. There's something, in, and, and I, can't, I can't spend a lot of time on this, but this is just something about bowing down that is so expressive of our relationship with God. That's so expressive of our heart toward God. Now, I know, I know right now we're kind of in a cycle of worship where, especially in the, on the contemporary side, where it's all about standing up in the presence of God. But if you look biblically, and there are times, some biblical examples of standing and raising your hands, but predominantly the physical expression of worship is one of bowing, of being surrendered, of even putting your forehead to the ground, of even laying full out before it, the presence of God, the holiness of God, and we see that taking place here. And if you can just imagine throughout this giant tent city where all these Israelites are and all that they've just gone through here with the whole deal with Moses coming down and the calf and all that kind of stuff, man, they're, they're, you, you know they still got to be a little bit shell-shocked and really seeking to recover, but they find such joy in knowing that God is still, he's right out there, he's still with us that all they can do is bow down. And can you imagine being in that camp and suddenly everybody in the door of every single tent just went down in the dirt and just went down about. And I'm like, man, wouldn't it be something to be in, a, in an auditorium somewhere, a room like this one, that one, outside in the parking lot, wherever it is, and, and the glory of God settle in such a way that all we could do would be, be just to bow down, just to humble ourselves before God. It will be. But I think it can be like that even now. Even now, um, I can't give, I, I can only give secondhand information of this, okay? Um, but, but, but <clears throat> I trust the person that told me her name is Gail Rustin. Um, when, I, when I was sick and I, and I finally worked my way up, uh, kept graduating from hospital to hospital, ended up in Macon at uh, Coliseum. And so I'm back there, you know, just kind of taking a break in the room, not really having a clue what's going on. Uh, but I understand that there were just loads of people in the waiting room out there. I mean, just, and there was food being brought, and there were, you know, card games being played, and, and I'm like, that's so offensive. I'm back there dying, and people are playing cards while I'm back there. And, and, they, and, and Gail tells a story about one lady, and she was with like three other family members. And I think it was the father, maybe her husband and the father of the other ones was also back there in the ICU and uh, was not doing well. And she had been back there. This lady had been back there with those. And she came out and there were all these people there and not the fellowship and the prayer. There was a lot of prayer going on, a ton of prayer going on, all this kind of stuff. And she approached Gail and some others that were standing there and they said, I, I just kind of asked. She said, the minute I walked in here and all y'all were here, I sensed the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I knew something was going on. Who, who you know, and wh why are all y'all here? And, and they began to tell her, you know, our pastor, her husband, whatnot, he's back there in the back, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. She goes, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I just got chills on my arms when I walked in here. The presence of the Spirit of God was so, so powerful, and it was. I, I wasn't aware of it except the fact that I'm here talking about it now, which means it was, it was the real thing. I mean, sometimes the presence of God is, is, is palpable. I mean, it's like you've run into it and, and, and it has come over you. And oh, to, to pursue and to seek and to treasure those kind of moments in worship and to be ready to bow down and to, to, to just humble ourselves before God, not just with our lips, but even with our body language. It's a beautiful thing. I made a little notes right here. I thought about these people in their tents uh, st standing and watching and then the, the, the presence of God, um, the evidence of the presence of God, and then they, they bowed down. They, they bowed down. Um, what, what do you think motivated that? Fear? Fear? Worship? Reverence? And all of those are good. We, we, we should never forget the fear of the Lord. Not in a scaredy kind of, he's going to hurt me kind of way, but just in the sense of the power of his holiness. It's not something to be trifled with. His holiness is such that the ransom to bring righteousness into our lives through Christ was the death of Christ. So great is his holiness. 
So verse 11, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. And I just, I'm, I'm like, gosh, how cool. It's a phrase uh, means to be open and honest. They were speaking om- openly and honestly with each other. And I'm reminded uh, today that, you know, that's what your conversations need to be like with God. Open and honest. For instance, anybody in here ever not told the whole truth when you were praying about something? Not that you told a lie, but you just didn't tell the whole truth. Anybody in here? I have. I have. Why would we do that? It, it, huh? We're scarred. We're scarred? We're scared. scared. Okay, we're scared. And scarred. And scarred. Yeah, both fit there. I mean, have you ever thought about you're, you're praying to the God who knows every minute detail of your life, every thought before you think it, every word before you speak it. He already knows. But he desires our openness and honesty because he knows he, he is somewhat constricted in what he can do with us until we come to that place of laying it all out there and saying, this is me. This is, I've thought this. I've felt this. I, I want this. When I'm, when I'm doing discipling one-on-one with people, we're talking about sin in their life that keeps tripping them up. And I said, have you, have you admitted to God that you wanted to do that? Oh, no, no, no. I said, why not? That's part of your problem right there. God, I want, there's a part of me that wants to do this. I need, I need you to get that want out of me. I can't do it. I can't. That's hard to look into the face of God and say, God, I, I want this. I want this illicit relationship. I want this pornography. I want that whatever it is. Moses and God, they got together. They had some kind of relationship. They spoke face to face openly and honestly as one speaks to a friend. Now afterwards, Moses would would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. Just a quick aside. Who do we keep hearing about that's kind of in the shadow in all that Moses is doing. Joshua. Now, guess what? Joshua is growing. He is learning because he's fixing to step up. And we're going to see how God uses him in a powerful way. Just an encouragement to you, okay? You got to grow into what God wants to use you for in the fullness of his purposes. There's a growing season for all of us. And and it really never ends, but there's some specific growing seasons where God says, no, no, it's not time for you yet. I'm still working on you. Let me finish my work, and then you won't believe how I want to use you for the glory of my kingdom. But man, that's hard. It's hard to live in the shadows, isn't it? It's hard to just get these, you know, little references, so to speak. But Joshua is so faithful, and we see that God does use him a little bit later. One day Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land. But you haven't told me whom you will send with me. Now, I love this. So Moses is going to, now Moses is getting down to what's really on his heart. You have told me, I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways you hear what Moses is asking right there? I mean, stop and think. God, I want to know more. I, I want to grasp deeper realities of who you are and how you work and, and, and why. I, I'm not satisfied. And I, I want more. I want, I want more. I, I want to know. Let me know your way so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. Moses wanted to know more of God. He wanted more intimacy. See, I think as a pastor and also as a fellow believer in Christ, that that one of the big problems in the churches in America and around the world, but really in America because of the abundance of stuff that we have, that, that either we're not... All that hungry for deeper spiritual things. We, we don't have that hunger or desire. Or we're hungry for the wrong things. We're, we're hungry for a big emotional high. Or maybe we're hungry for just really good old purely academic knowledge about Scripture. 
And, and that in and itself is not a bad thing at all. But God's a relational God. He wants, he wants, he wants us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Sometimes that's why God might bring difficult times in our life because he, he's, he's trying to reorient our hunger, our craving, so that we crave a deeper connection with him. You know, it's in Matthew 5, 6 that God talks about, Jesus talks about, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, man, they'll be satisfied. What, what do you hunger for? What, what do you really want to know more of? Who do you want to know more about? Verse 14, the Lord replied, I will personally go with you. I'll go with you, Moses. I'll give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. And Moses said, now, I want, th this is, I, I guess this is maybe the, of all, of all the different things, this, this verse, as far as the heart of someone who is passionate about God, Moses said, now make sure you don't miss this. If you, speaking to God, he's talking to God. If you don't personally go with us, if you're going to appoint an angel to go with us, and you're not going with us personally, don't make us leave this place. I want you to think about that for a minute. Where are they right now? Where are they? Generally speaking, I'm not asking for like a latitude, longitude, but where are they? Yeah, they're in the wilderness. Where is it that they were headed? To a land flowing with milk and honey. They're going to live in houses they didn't build. They're going to have... Um, um, ten grapevines they did not plant. They're going to the drink of olive oil that, that they did not press. I mean, God, God, that's the promise God made all the way back to Abraham. That's where they're going. That's Moses' whole purpose in leading them out of Egypt to lead them into the promised land. And he says to God, God, the most important thing is to be in your presence. In effect, Moses is saying, I would rather be in the desert but in your presence than in a land flowing with milk and honey apart from you. That's, that's powerful. And, it, and you know, I'm saying this, I'm going, I, hey, wow. I don't, I don't know that I could have said that. I don't know if I could pray that. You know, the psalmist says in Psalm 84, 10, the psalmist says, better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. God, I, wherever you are, that is the place I want to be, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of, 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 of what it costs, regardless of the sacrifice, and regardless of what I might have to do without according to what the world says I need. God, I want to be where you are rather than in a better place, but without you. Tells us a lot about Moses right there, doesn't it? Reveals a lot of his heart, the character of that man. Verse 16, how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on earth. We got to, look, he's talking about, New Testament and the Old Testament, shadows of the new and the old. This, this, verse 16, is God's design for the church. God wants the church to look like nothing else in this world. God wants, Jesus said, he said, this is how people are going to know that you're my followers. In that what? You have big buildings. You remember that verse? Love, I, I, I kind of love the world doesn't see anywhere else. An agape love, a, a sacrificing, extravagant, service-oriented, beautiful, unconditional love for one another. And the only, peop, only, only place people will ever find that kind of love is within the body of Christ when it gathers together. And just the witness of that, just the witness of that kind of love pouring out of us toward one another will give witness of the fact that you belong to me. He wants us, he wants us, Moses says, look, your presence among us, it sets, sets your people, it sets us apart from, from everything else on earth, and so it should be for the body of Christ. 
Now, I'm not going to dig in on this one either, but I want to tell you something. One of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of my sister churches making is they're looking at culture and they're saying, we need to adapt to our culture. That is a grave mistake. We must always remember that we are, we are foreigners in this world. This is not our home. And our fellowship does not in any way need to mirror what's going on in our culture. We need to mirror the holiness of the God who lives in us by his Holy Spirit. We need to believe the fullness of all that our holy God teaches us in Scripture and walk by it. The Lord replied to Moses, I, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I, 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 look, I do look favorably on you, and I know you by name. It's incredible. God still knows us by name. He knows you by name. I love this. We like for people to know our name, don't we? Don't we? Just makes you feel when somebody, especially when, when you've only met them once or twice, and you see them out and they say, "Oh, hey, Keith," I'm like, "I don't know yours, but hey, hey, bud, I recognize your face. Anybody ever been in that one before? Somebody says, "Hey," and you're like, "Hey, how you doing? You can see, you. But man, it's something powerful when somebody knows our name. They call us by our name. We." It, it, it's, a, it's a great thing working out there with the baseball team. Some those freshmen that come up, you know, they're kind of they're kind of drinking out of a fire hydrant already, and they got all the insecurity stuff going on and all this stuff. And I, you know, I always get a roster at the start of the season and start learning names. And and so I'll start calling those kids when I see them, you know, in the dugout or in the locker room or whatnot. You know, I'll call, I say, Hey, Jay, what's going on? And every time I do it for the first time, it stops them. It kind of stops them for a second because they're like, He knows my. How you know my name? The Father knows your name. That, that's how precious you are to him. He knows your name. Verse 18, Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. What a, that's an incredible thing. And, we, and we're familiar with this. So let's read it real quick. So the Lord replied, okay, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose. I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock. And as my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock. I will let the rock be your shield from the power, the consuming presence and power of my holiness. I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind or see my back, but my face will not be seen. It's just, it's just a reminder to us, just a reminder that even in our familiarity with God, we need to walk with great reverence with God. Uh, some of you know this. I don't know if everybody knows it, but for four years while I was in college, I worked at Georgia Power Company. Okay, and um, I love those four years working there. I learned an awful lot about, obviously, electricity and the transmission side of it. And um, and it was really interesting. You know, I started out as a as a uh, basically a a gopher on on a line crew, and then just kind of worked up through the line crew, and ended up my last year in the uh, uh, on the engineering side, working uh, mechanical drawing blueprints for jobs and whatnot. It's just really cool. I learned a lot of stuff. My second year there. Uh, and, and by this time, I was going up in the bucket truck, you know, depending on what the job was, for the simple stuff, that, the, that you know, lineman's on the ground, he would send me up. And then when it was really important stuff, then I stayed on the ground. And people knew what they were doing, they went up in the bucket truck. I learned how to climb poles. That was one of the greatest things in the world, learned how to climb a, a power pole. I thought I was Superman. Put my spurs on. That, we had them back there in the, what, what they called the barn, out behind the barn where we came in every night where all the trucks part, and they had the climbing poles where the rookies like me learned how to climb, and all the linemen would get around. They would just, 
you know, they would give you all the technical stuff, you know, about putting on your spurs and what you do and how you dig them in and make sure you want to kind of be at an angle and you're going up and you've got to have your safety harness on. And then one of the last things they'd say, they'd say, now what you need to do, okay, you know, provide stability is you need to wrap your arms around that pole. You just got to wrap around, just hug that pole like it's the most important thing in the world. And then just bring those spurs up and set them and go up, go up, go up. And then come down, you need to hold on that pole and just kind of shimmy down. Now, I wasn't the first and I wasn't the last, but I want to tell you something. This is back in the day, and it's not, it, it's not this way anymore, but this is back in the day when all the poles were covered in creosote. I didn't know what creosote could do to human skin until I woke up the next morning. I wasn't the only rookie that went through that hazing. My arms, they were just one giant blister. I mean, it had just come up and I had to wrap those things. I mean, it's crazy. This guy, I'm glad I had a shirt on. I can't imagine what happened or in pants, you know, if I hadn't. But, you know, you're working there and, 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 and going through all that, and, you know, you, you, you learn a lot, and, and, and you think about what's going on. And, and, and then my second year, we got a call, and um, an emergency call, and all trucks were directed um, to load up and head out to, at that time, it was called Glencoe. Anybody remember Glencoe? It's now Fletsy, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. But it used to be a Naval Air Station. And Georgia Power was in the process of transitioning everything on that base from overhead transmission to underground. So basically, we would, we would set the underground transformers, run all the power to wherever, and then we would we would run the transmission from the transmission transformer down to that ground so we could just take out all the poles, taking all the poles and overhead. It just looks better. And um, in a place where there's a lot of hurricanes and whatnot, it reduces a lot of the, the chances for power, you know, power lines coming down. Brookie Carter was a guy who was a lineman, lead lineman, redheaded dude, big old dude, 6'2", 230, 40 pounds, loud, uh, loud personality, good, good guy. Um, but uh, it, his crew was out there working. And Brookie was up in, in a high ranger, the bucket truck. There are manual controls at the base of a bucket truck where if something happens up there or if a control stops working, the person that's on the ground can, can go there, the, the big base of that bucket, and operate those controls to get it back down and figure out what's wrong. Brookie was up there, and, and these, these, were, these were the transmission lines. These are, these are not the secondary lines. These are transmission lines coming in. And he was always really careful. He had he, 20, 25 years' experience. But, you know, a lot of stuff going on, and he went to swing, swing the, his bucket, which meant the arm extending him up, the elbow of the arm on which the bucket was. It swung around, and when it did, it contacted with one of those 72 kV transmission lines. And unknown to us at the time, unknown to the company at the time, the insulation on the boom of that bucket had a crack in it. And as soon as he hit that 72 kV transmission line, he dropped out of sight because he was in the midst of being just totally fried. So the first guy ran up to grab a hold of the controls at the bottom but because the insulation had a mar in it, it was allowing that, that electricity to run all the way down into the truck. So when he stepped up and grabbed a hold of those controls, it started go coursing through him. And one other guy came up from the ground and tried to grab him by the arm to pull him off the truck, and it got him. And as we were arriving, we had to go... We had to go down to the next transformer pole and pull the fuses to stop the power running through before we could do anything. And I was 19, going on 20 years old at the time when I got there. Uh, the one thing I saw, and I didn't see a lot of it, and I'm glad I didn't, but one thing I saw was you had this guy up on the truck, and you had uh, his arm behind him, and the guy that on the ground had reached up to try to help him, okay? But he had to step up onto the bottom step, metal step of the truck, to get up there. And where this guy had grabbed a hold of the other guy's arm, the power of that electricity had just melted his hand into the arm. All three of those guys died. 
one of the worst accidents, work time accidents in Georgia power history. I tell you that story not to gross you out. As powerful as a major transmission line is, and even in your familiarity with working around and with that kind of power, you have to have reverence for that power or it can kill you. I want to tell you something. The power in a transmission line does not even compare to the power of the glory of our Holy Father. We need to enjoy his friendship with great, great reverence. Great reverence. Just for those who might say, well, what about, what about, you know, a lot of times God speaks to us in anthropomorphic terms to just because, you know, we can't see God. Um, talks here about his hand, meaning he would have an arm and his back, you know, and, and, and certainly his angels appear in human form. And, but but that, that's not, I don't want you to get hung up on that. Um, his arm really is kind of a reference to his power, his back as uh, a reference to um, his glory and the amount of the glory that, that Moses could see. I read one commentator, he put it like this. He said, I want to, he said, the best way to understand this moment with Moses, God showing himself walking by, Moses seeing his back, he said, think of it as what you see when you look up and you see the exhaust of a jet. The jet's already gone. You see the evidence of that jet, though, by the trail it leaves. That's kind of what's going on here. God comes by, and, and just as he comes by, and even as he's shielding him behind the rock and with his hand, as he comes by and he's telling him his name, I am Yahweh, and he walks by and his glory goes, it's the residual of that glory that Moses encounters. And just a little bit we're going to see, the next time he comes down off the mountain, what do the people see on his face? That residual glory of God of being in his presence. When you think about the power, the absolute pure power, majesty of the holiness of God, it should forever change the way you sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Because were it not for Christ, we would never stand before God. Let's pray. Stand up. Let's pray. Stand up. Stand up and let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to study from your word. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would apply truth into our lives. You would uh, bring us to the place of being open and honest with you because you are always open and honest with us. I thank you for the people in this room who think it important enough to make being here on Wednesday a priority and being with us online a priority. I pray you would honor that back into their lives. So now as we leave, bless every home represented and keep us safe as we go our separate ways. And Father, already begin preparing our hearts to worship together uh, Sunday morning. We love you tonight. We thank you for the glory of your holiness. And we thank you for the righteousness of Christ that wraps us up and makes us presentable before you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.